Thank you. There was a, uh, a husband who was speaking to his wife and he told her, you're a half hour late. You know, I hate to stand around waiting for you, looking like a fool. Wife replied, I'm sorry, dear, but I have nothing to do with the way you stand around. <laughs> and when it hits close to home. All right, Genesis 1. I mean 9. <laughs> Genesis 9. We better not go back there. We're going to continue. Last week, last time I was with you, we were looking at uh, blessings. Uh, blessing, remember we've looked at uh, procreation. We've looked at prominence. And we've looked at provision. And those are all three positive blessings. Or positives, maybe uh, the way it fits into your outline. Uh, so we have this first three, which are positive blessings. And then we have two others, which are negative in the sense that they speak to us about things that need to be avoided. All right? So I think of the first three are positive, the last two are negative. And remember, these are blessings to everybody, to all of humanity. So the first of the negative of the uh, blessings on our word list, every word has to start with P. So this word is prohibition. P-R-O-H-I-B-I-T-I-O-N, prohibition. The world is a, a fallen world, and in, the, in this world we study uh, what is called the law of in, in, entropy, or entropy, if you prefer. And that's a law that talks about things are disintegrating, things are getting worse. There's mutations, there's all these things uh, that cause greater and greater damage in the world. We've witnessed in the last 20 years more and more diseases, parasites, dangerous viruses, bacterias, and as time progresses, this law of entropy would say that those things will continue, in fact, they will, they will even heighten. So what we have here in verse 4 in chapter 9 is a prohibition to cause so that we don't run into some of these problems. In chapter 9, verse 4, it says, But sh you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. So just previous to this, God has said you can eat everything. Remember we studied that? That that's one of our blessings? But now he says, uh, before you get too carried away, I want to protect you. I want to prohibit you from eating some things. And God's protecting everybody. He's protecting the saved and the unsaved here because this is a common grace. This is his goodness. Uh, remember, I, remember I, I talked about getting that mixed grill. Anybody ever had a mixed grill where you get a a piece of fish and a piece of chicken and a piece of meat all on one plate? Boy, I'm getting hungry right now. <laughs> if I start drooling on my computer, I'll probably blow it up. But make sure, if you get a, a, a mixed grill, that everything is cooked. Don't eat flesh with its life in it. And remember I was talking to you last, last week about people that eat live meat. Uh, and some of you had an incredulous look on your face, but there are some people that eat live meat. And one of those, uh, one of those uh, peoples are, I read about in a commentary by two gentlemen named Harold and Balak. Harold and Balak. And in there, they, they speak about the early church in uh, Ethiopia and they record about how these Ethiopian herdsmen would, uh, if they got hungry on the road, they would cut a piece of meat out of the hindquarter of a cow that they might be driving and eat it just like that without ever cooking it. And uh, in fact, 
uh, they considered it to be a delicacy to eat it that way. And they didn't want to kill the animal because they still needed the animal. So they just cut a piece of meat off the animal <laughs> and just went along the road. And they'd patch them up and, and continue to use that animal to pull their stuff. Now, if you ate too much, after a while, you're going to be out of luck. But uh, I don't know. They thought it was a delicacy. So, uh, And they're not the only people in history. If you look at it, there are people that have, uh, that have considered it to be a delicacy to eat a live animal. So, in, so in some cases, uh, so what it's talking about here says, don't eat flesh with its life. That is its blood. Is that what your Bible says? Yes. So that to me is raw meat. Uh, is that, would that be considered raw meat? No. Yeah. With its life, with its blood. Yeah, raw meat. Uh, so don't eat live animals. Don't eat uncooked the uncooked flesh of a slaughtered animal? And why would you not eat the uncooked flesh of a slaughtered animal? Parasites, bacteria, microorganisms, viruses. That's why we got all these rules about cooking meat to certain temperatures. Uh, and in the fallen world uh, that we're all surrounded by, people, that's how you get, uh, what is it? Uh, Salmonella, yeah, trigonosis, trigonosis uh, staphylococcus, tapeworm. I always thought tapeworm would be cool because you'd lose weight if you had a tapeworm. But tapeworms are in raw meat, you know. It's like medium or rare meat if you steak rare, and that's considered. Uh, Come on, brother. Yeah. I'm eating prime rib Friday night, and it's going to be medium rare. It's going to be moving. My brother Denny, he cooks a steak five minutes at 300 degrees on each side and eats it. But, you know, it's not so critical here uh, in the United States because we have a lot of different policies and agencies, you know, the USDA and, or the FDA or, uh, you know, all these, we have all these food inspectors. But you know, when we lived in Athens, Greece, you went down to downtown Athens, and there was a there was a street. It was kind of like an alley, and on the entire street, on one end, there was a big. The opening was probably like something like this: a big white sheet. And you would walk in on the other side of that white sheet, and all the way for about eight or ten blocks, there were white sheets hanging down both sides of this alley or street, whatever you want to call it. It looked like an alley because it had all these sheets hanging out. And on each side were these meat cutters. Just, there was no refrigeration. Everything was hung and you would go up and tell them what you wanted and they would cut it out for you. So it's not that way in America. You couldn't do that in America, but the other places, other parts of the world, you know, huh? It is normal. Uh, uh, in the Orient, uh, in the Middle East. Uh, here we, you know, you can't eat an uncooked animals, really, not legally, but I guess you could if you wanted to. But, uh, but it can be very harmful. So the Lord places this prohibition about don't eat, don't eat flesh with its blood when it still has life. Uh, and some people have correlated this particular verse to having something to do with... Uh, uh, God's atonement, uh, maybe, but I think the main idea here is God just wants to protect us. He had just told Noah, you can eat everything, and then he puts this restriction on how you can eat everything. And you don't want to, have you ever had, uh, have you ever ate blood? Yes. Have you? My, uh, Scottish blood pudding? It's, uh, fried blood. Yeah. My dad used to make, uh, he used to hang chickens on a clothesline and drain the blood out of them and make pudding, blood pudding. Germans have a dish they call kahaktus. It's the raw ground meat, beef. Yeah. And they just put that on a bagel and, or hard roll and eat it like that. Yeah. It's actually good. Mm. Yeah, I've heard of the Scottish blood pudding. 
they, they fry it and they cut it up. Kind of make a, almost a patty out of yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. They must cook it in a mold. It's kind of, of uh, brittle, isn't it? Uh, depending on its, yellow, you know, depending on its, the, how thick it is. You know, they, you, we saw it served for breakfast. But hmm. So there's a pro there would seem to be a prohibition here on blood, and that's pretty obvious why all diseases, uh, many diseases, are carried through the body by blood, correct? The health ramifications uh, from blood can be really serious. Uh, you know, uh, you can get like some kind of stomach infection from drinking blood, and there are people that drink blood yeah. Uh, in the history of the world, oftentimes uh, in some of your most pagan societies, if you conquered another per people, you drank their blood because that would, that would indicate your victory and you would take their power from them by drinking their blood. So uh, demonstrate a way of con how they had been conquered and to take their, their power. But human blood, Drinking, you, if you drank human blood, you could get AIDS, meningitis, pneumonia, flu, Ebola, encephalitis, hepatitis, tetanus. You can get locked jaw from drinking blood if you don't want any of that. So God knew this. God knows this. And when Noah stepped on, off the boat, he had had this, uh, I would imagine it was a special relationship with the animals. I don't know if Noah was a flesh eater at that time. He may, he may not have been. He may have been. Uh, I think the rest of the world, I, uh, I think devout people may not have been, but the rest of the world may have been. Uh, but he needed, Noah needed to know how he was going to survive in this new world. So God gave him all these things and told him, you can eat all these things. And then he tells him, but don't eat things that are alive. Don't, uh, don't drink blood. Don't. Don't eat things that have, uh, still have blood in them that hasn't been cooked. So, and God even, God, even, uh, God even invented a way to cook stuff. I believe that was before this time, but he had given them fire. So, uh, so that's the first negative blessing. Positively, we've looked at procreation, prominence, provision, the positive ones, prohibition, and then finally, the last one, and this is where we'll spend most of our time tonight, is protection. And I don't know, I don't think, well, uh, for some people this is, can be controversial. Uh, but I can tell you one thing, this isn't controversial in the Bible. In verse 5 it says, surely for your lifeblood I will demand a reckoning. From the hand of every beast I will require it and from the hand of man. From the hand of every brother's, man's brother, I will acquire the life of a man. And here's, here's, uh, and here's when it's required, verse 6. Whoever sheds man's blood by man, his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God, he made man. And this, uh, and this is a law, I would say it is a predominant law of God for the social protection of our society. And it is the law of capital punishment. And you outline the words for capital punishment. Who, grow, who poses the greatest threat to the life of another man? A man, correct? That's the greatest threat. And, uh, you know, bacteria and viruses and microorganisms, et cetera, et cetera, uh, may be a threat to humanity. But really, it's man who's man's greatest uh, enemy, the greatest threat to his life. And so God designed, God in his wisdom, designed a law, I'm trying to get to Genesis here, he designed a law that would protect man from man. Do we have a problem in the world with murder? Yes. Yeah. Yesterday in New York, 
<laughs> today. Yeah. Was that from that guy running him over in the car? Mm -hmm. Is that how many died? Twelve? Something like that. Eight, 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 eight eleven injured. Eight died. Eight died. Yeah. Yeah, eight died. You know, it's, it's, it has struck our own church with Karen Pike's son. Yeah. Killed in a random break-in. They thought nobody was in the house. They broke into the house and just shot him. You know, vici viciously shot him. So, God designed a law uh, to help us through this area because uh, murder is a problem. What was the first sin in the Old Testament? What did he, Cain killed his brother? It's called fratricide, one brother killing another brother. And God gives an effective protection for this by essentially saying in his word, if somebody kills somebody, what are you supposed to do to them? Kill him, kill him. Now there's a lot of pre, there's a lot of uh, precursors. There's a lot of uh, restrictions when you look at Levitic, uh, uh, Levi, uh, when the of the laws in Leviticus and stuff. There's a lot of there is things that we, you would equate to uh, manslaughter and stuff like that. But a lot of people will say, well, the psychological studies and criminal studies say that. Capital punishment is not a deterrent. Well, I think, I bet that it is. You know why? Because dead people can't kill anybody else. So that's a serious deterrent. If you're dead, you can't kill anybody else. And I don't care about all that psychological gobbledygook. It is a deterrent. So in verse 5, uh, there's, this isn't really a, 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 law, a class in criminal law. This is a class in, uh, in the Word of God. It's in the words, Word of God isn't really massive in its uh, projection of law, but God wants to protect us from each other, and this is how he's going to do it. He's going to require your lifeblood. Lifeblood is a synonym, synonym for death. He's going to require your lifeblood. That word require is an interesting word. It's a judicial term in Hebrew, and it means to compensate, to recompense, to satisfy. Literally what it means is to, in your outline, the word is avenge. It means to avenge, okay? And uh, what it, so what this means is God is saying, I'm going to require compensation from you. So that's a divine death sentence, if you will. Uh, and this, I want to say that I think this is a new requirement because when Cain killed a Abel, did God tell him he was going to kill him? No, he did not. Uh, God, God didn't give the pre-flood civilization this protection of uh, capital punishment. Maybe if he had, things wouldn't have gotten so bad so fast. But, you know, Cain was not killed by God. Now, he was afraid that somebody else might kill him because of their relationship with Abel. Uh, they, somebody else might want vengeance on him. And even in the fourth chat chapter, uh, Lamech, you remember, said that he had killed a man, and he was proud about it. But there's no indication there that God was requiring his life, but now after the flood in the new world, God's going to provide this blessing to humanity. He didn't provide it before. He's going to authorize, he, he says, you can eat whatever you want, anything and everything. Uh, he tells them to cook it so they don't get uh, bad things in their body that will cause them to die. And he's going to place into effect capital punishment to prevent people from killing each other. And again, in verse 5, surely for your life blood, I will demand a reckoning. Uh, if you were to look in Psalms 912, God actually just self describes himself as he who avenges blood. So that Psalm qualifies God, identifies God as the one 
who, uh, who avenges or requires blood at blood shedding. Okay? And it's other places in the Old Testament, 2 Chronicles, chapter 4, 2 King, or 2 Samuel, chapter, 2 Chronicles 24, 2 Kings chapter 4, or 2 Samuel chapter 4, I'll get it straight sooner or later. But not, not, not only humans, but the Lord, first of all, says, first of all, he makes a reference. Who does he speak about first? I will, from the hand of every beast, I will require it. So what's he saying? He's saying if you've got an animal that kills a person, what are you supposed to do with the animal? Because remember, he's placed a, a fear and dread on the animals between them and man. So if an animal has stepped over those bounds, he's saying, you should kill that animal. <laughs> Exodus 21, it says that if an ox gores a man or a woman to death, the ox should surely be stoned, don't eat its flesh, and the owner of the ox shall go unpunished. If, however, the ox was previously in the habit of goring, and its owner had previously been warned, yet he doesn't confine the ox, and it kills a man or a woman, the ox shall be stoned, and the owner shall be put to death. <laughs> I, would, I, would, I would say kill that ox. <laughs> Go ahead and kill that ox. But if you don't control your animals, the inference is you can lose your own life. So God will avenge the death of a man by an animal. Okay? All right? So, uh, if God will avenge the death of a man by an animal, how much more will he avenge the death of a man by a man? See, somewhere along the line, we lost the idea that God takes killing a person very, very seriously. We really have. Our system is just so jaded. And look in verse 6, it says, Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. Okay? And very, very, very precise in what it says. Okay? Very precise. Let me find out where I'm at here. I lost my place. My computer went crazy. But God takes this whole thing very, very seriously. Uh, very precise. This is what's called, I know you don't need to know this, but this is called a chiostic parallelism. A chiostic parallelism. And what does that mean? It means... In the second half of the sentence, it repeats what's in the first half of the sentence. It's a Hebrew way of writing. So it says, whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. Okay? Kind of repeats it. But. And all of this, when you look at this whole big picture in regards to uh, capital punishment, this is what's called the law of Lex Talanius. Lex Talanius and what Lex Talanius means is the law of retaliation. Have you ever heard, and I know you have, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth? Exodus 21. If you shed a man's blood, if you meet murder somebody, that's what that means, if you shed his blood, that, then your blood is to be shed. And, and don't take this whole, de this isn't, has nothing to do with personal, in your outline the word is vengeance, personal vengeance. This is simply the responsibility that humanity has to each other. If you kill someone, your life will be taken. And your life is taken by a man. And uh, under divine mandate, it's God's law and a man does it to you, they are an instrument of, of God's... See, the, the one that's actually taking vengeance is, isn't man, it's God. God requires this on murderers. And all through Scripture, 
there, you know, in scripture there's a forbidding of personal vengeance. But in scripture there is not a prohibition on societal vengeance. Societal vengeance is prescribed under God's law so man doesn't kill all the other men. And when you get to the New Testament, Jesus confirms this if you went to Matthew 26, towards the end of the chapter in the 52nd verse. Remember, Jesus is in the garden and the soldiers come to take him. And who's his hero? It's Peter. And Peter does what? He pulls out a sword. And he swings the sword at the servant of the high priest, Malichus. Malichus is probably in the front of the crowd because he's the high priest's servant. He's kind of overseeing everything. And what do you think Peter was trying to do when he swung that sword at Malichus? You think he was trying to cut off his ear? <laughs> he was trying to cut off his head. And you got to remember, was Peter a sword fighter? <laughs> he was a fisherman. Malachus was really lucky. Uh, you know, you don't use a, and those swords were swords. You don't use a sword just to scratch a person or to whack off their ear, okay? So Peter, who probably, this guy probably ducked, and that's what saved him because he almost lost his head. But what did Jesus say to Peter? Jesus told Peter, put your sword in its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. So what's Jesus saying? He's saying if you take a man's life, you got to give your own life. You can't use the sword to kill somebody with just impunity. You take his life, they have a right to take your life. So Jesus said, all those who take up the sword are going to die by the sword. All who will all who kill should themselves die. And so in that, I take Jesus is upholding this idea, this law of capital punishment. Paul, Acts 25, 11, said the same thing. In 25, 11, Paul is in the city of Zarina. And he says to Festus, remember he's talking to Festus, I, every time I read that name Festus, I think of that guy on Gunsmoke. Was it Gunsmoke? <laughs> I didn't know that. First time I read that, I said, man, that guy was in the Bible. <laughs> but what Paul says to Festus, he says, if I'm an offender and I've committed anything worthy of death, I don't object to dying. He said, if I've, if I've done a deed which is worthy of death, and by worthy, he means... <coughs> that that's the proper sentence, he says, I don't object to dying. Paul understood that capital punishment was a law, a law of God. And he said, if I've done anything worthy of death, I don't refuse to die. I can accept my execution. Uh, Romans 13, very familiar section of scripture, very clear. It tells us if you do evil, you need to be afraid for it does not bear the sword for nothing. And what's being talked about in Romans 13 is the government. The government is a minister of God. That's what it's talking about here. It's talking about authority, the powers that be. And it says, if you do evil, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. So what's a sword for? It's not to slap somebody around, it's to kill somebody. It's a deadly weapon. It wasn't a whip, it was an instrument of death. And he says the government uh, doesn't have this instrument of death for nothing, but rather as an avenger of God who brings God's wrath on people who practice evil. So Paul taught, Paul submitted himself to civil authorities, submitted to the government of the uh, Roman Empire in regards to the idea of capital punishment. And governments are supposed to wield the power of capital punishment as, in your outline, the word is ministers 
of God, is what it says in Romans 13. You know, I understand it's unpleasant to think of lethal injection. It's probably even more unpleasant to think of electric electrocution. Unpleasant to think of people being hung. Firing squads. Does Utah still have firing squads? They did. I don't know if they still do. There were a couple states that still do. The guillotine. There have been a lot of modes of death used. Uh, but all of those modes were used as a stand against threats to the stability of a, what's supposed to be a civilized society. <coughs> and it's a protective power, a, necessi a necessity <laughs> determined not by me, not by the legal system, but by the creator for the blessing of his creation. You know, we put people in jail for killing animals. And then we let guys go that kill people. You know, God says you can go ahead and kill the animals and eat anything you want. You know, and I, I'm not, you know, I'm not saying go around and kill your neighbor's pet or climb over somebody's fence and shoot their cow. But there's obvious limitations, but the general pattern is that what God has already said here in, uh, in Genesis is that the creatures are for who? They're for us. If you need a horse to ride, you ride a horse. If you need a goat to cut the grass, get a goat. If you want to eat them, I don't know about the horse, but if you want to eat the goat, you can eat them. We can do all of that, but, but listen, once you kill a man, you should lose your life. Big, big, big difference, but now where we're, we're trying to make, see, if, we're, if, we're the process, if we are the end results of evolution, that means animals and us are in fact the same. They're just on a different evolutionary branch of the tree. So what we've tried to do with animals is make them the same as humanity. But there's a big difference. Uh, what is it? Why, why, why does God take it so seriously when somebody kills a man? Verse 6, for in the image of God, he made man. So we're back to that same reality that men are transcendent. When I say image, that's what I mean. Man is like God in that he is transcendent. He is eternal. He is spiritual. He is a personal entity. And listen, there's nothing as devastating in human experience as somebody dying, right? You know, you can lose your job and you can survive. You can lose your house and survive. You can lose your kidney, survive. You can, you can have something amputated, normally survive. You can lose your pet, your dog. But the pain of all pains is when you lose somebody in your family isn't it? And it's because of who we are, our personhood, because of relationships, because you and I, and I hope you understand this and I hope you feel this, we have a spiritual connection. So murder, as God sees it, is the sin of the highest rank in the physical realm. It is, in fact, without a doubt, the ultimate crime. It's in the area of crimes, it is the crime of all crimes. You can steal a man's cow, you can steal his sheep, burn his field, ruin his reputation, those are bad things. But the worst thing you can do to somebody is kill them. It devastates them, they're gone from this realm, and it devastates their family. It's the ultimate crime against the highest of God's creation. 
Somebody who is created in God's image, who is transcendent, personal, and eternal, and a murderer has re So take that picture. A murderer removes someone who has the image of God from the earth. And consequently, I like to think about it as that they disfigure the image of God as God determined it to be. And maybe, like I said, the widespread evil in the pre-flood world was aided and abetted by a failure to deal with murderers. And I'll tell you one thing, and you know, I, I wrote a paper on this at Wayland Baptist. I'm convinced today that crime in our society, especially killing, is aided and abetted by our failure to kill murderers and to kill them swiftly. Our judicial, this thing with that Karen has been in is over a year. Almost, almost two years. Almost, almost two, two years. years. With no end yet in sight. What happened to the right for the speedy trial? What happened to that? Well, that's supposed to be a right for the, for the accused. Yeah. Society, yeah. In, in Levitical law, society had a right to a speedy trial. And what happened is the legal system turned that whole thing around. And as I said earlier, Mosaic law does provide lesser punishments for manslaughter, for accidental inadvertent killings. And I'm not talking about war, where you're defending yourself or your country against an attacker who would be a murderer against you. Actually, in, the, in Mosaic Law, I think there's about 35 sins in Mo Mosaic Law which actually call for capital punishment. 35. But the very top of the chain is murder. So here you have this new world, and God provides these blessings. Procreation, you're able to have kids, marriage, family, prominence, Man rules, he's the king of the earth, all the animal life, the plant life, everything is for his enjoyment. Provision, God provides for him everything he needs. And, the, and then you have these last two blessings we've looked at today, prohibition. God says don't eat raw meat, don't drink blood, it's harmful, uh, you might get some kind of disease. And then there is a protection of all protections that labels one who is a murderer as one who should have his own life taken. And all of these things then are common graces that access to everybody. And what these common graces demonstrate to you and I is that God is patient. And God wants, God, listen, God wants everybody to see him, right? Because in Romans 2, 4, what does God want? God wants, God's patience is meant to lead men in your outline, the word is repentance. This is, in fact, God's goodness for all of humanity. And I'm sad to say, God has been patient. And he's been gracious, and he's been kind, and he's been good to sinners. And he hasn't destroyed the world again since the flood, and he's not going to until the very end. And so we can say with the Apostle Paul what he said in uh, 2 Corinthians 6. Now is the day of salvation, right? This is the time that people need to see the blessings of God, the good hand of God in the world to understand his patience and forbearance, to recognize that he has overlooked their sinfulness, the accumulated sinfulness of man and it's time for man to understand how gracious God has, be, has been. But the sad thing is, as Romans 1 reflects, even though God has done all these things, all of these things we have from God, mankind still glorified him not as God. Your word in the outline is glorified. And that's just man. From the day that God made his promise until today, these blessings continue 
the blessings that are noted here in our source scripture tonight. And when man follows them, he can enjoy the best of a, what we might consider a physical life. But all of that is not an end unto itself. All that is is a means to get to an end. You know, good health is a great blessing. And you understand that the older you get. But God's patience, God's forbearance, is intended to lead us to recognize how benevolent, gracious, merciful, and kind he is. He has not dealt with us according to our, iniquity, inic our own iniquities. In fact, he has sent his son for us to embrace as Lord and Savior to wipe away our iniquities. We still live in an age of grace and in, a day, in the days of salvation. But I do not know how much longer. Just look at what's going on. Everywhere. And it's only going to get worse. Questions?